Perfect. Well, let's kick this thing off. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Wicked Energy with JG. I'm here with my man, Jeff Can, author, speaker, trainer on all things digital transformation in the energy sector, man of many talents. Uh, clearly, if you are following him on LinkedIn, you notice he, he's got his experiences are about 3000 words long. I mean, I say all that to say is there's gonna be a ton of, I mean, good takeaways, education, um, just a phenomenal conversation on on a hot topic that's digital transformation. Um, got a, you know again a wealth of knowledge in different sectors, and so I'm excited to have you on the show, Jeff. How is everything in your world today, man? Uh, today is a uh, uh, foggy, <laughs> as it is the weather outside. I live on the uh, outside Vancouver uh, in British Columbia, north yeah. of Seattle. So we share we share weather systems with Seattle. So if you know what Seattle's like, you pretty much know what's going on here. Yeah, no, it's uh in in if I had to guess, you're joining us. Is it uh it's C Schuholt BC, right? <laughs> so it's it's uh Seashelt is how it's Seashelt. pronounced. Okay. Yeah, it's a anglicized version of Shalish, which is a First Nations uh word for the body of water between Vancouver Island and um and the uh, and the and the mainland. Right. And uh, so, uh, so it's bastardized and and turned into sea shelt. Uh, okay. But yeah, that's the that's the little town. Got it. So I'm familiar with the area. So I grew up in Vernon, BC. Oh, uh, yeah, nice. I was uh, yeah born in Calgary, raised in British Columbia. So I spent a lot of time, obviously, in the Okanagan Valley. Spent sure. a lot of time out in Van Victoria. Yes. I've never been to sea shelt, um, but I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, I've been again. That's where Maybe I grew up. So. What's Did that? You ever, to, you ever go to Gibson's Landing or the Sunshine Coast? Because that's where it's located. When I was younger, yes, yes. Well, we had I had some family that lived out in that area actually. So, uh, yeah, it's again small world. Um, and and we were talking about this before we started recording, but um, the, your background there has pictures and some artwork, which yeah. is super fascinating. The one on the right, there's you said is the Bow River. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's right. So that's actually a painting of the Bull River in Calgary, which uh, if you're a fisherman, you'll know is a world class uh, salmon and trout fishery, mm -hmm. uh, fly casting. So it's very popular there. Yeah. And, uh, these are um, uh, artwork carved from a local artist and uh, uh, they they are part of the, the indigenous uh, art culture of this part of the world. So yeah. This is carvings of eagles holding baby eagles and one is a um one is like a negative if you think about a film where you have uh, a negative uh, actually the idea of film is becoming a crazy idea young people would probably have never seen film but <laughs> if you did a, if you did a, a film a photo you vote you sort of uh, uh developed um a negative film in a traditional film processing lab you you have a negative image well one of these is a negative image and the yeah other is a positive image so no that's, that's uh that is so cool. I, I mean, growing up in BC, I spent, you know, obviously there's a lot of that artwork and there's a lot of influence from the yep. indigenous people throughout British Columbia. Um, and in the Vancouver airport, actually, there's tons of that style artwork. If I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've been out of the van airport, but they had like really beautiful yes. artwork and, and, and monuments yep. and statues and like of yep. whales and all kinds of yep. awesome stuff. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, part of the culture is to celebrate the artwork of the local people. So, yeah. 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 No, that's uh, that's super cool, man. I think you're one of the first people I've uh, interviewed from BC. So anyway, um, a good way to kick off the conversation. Jeff, how long? So it's interesting being up there. You're part of, you know, the energy world. I'm curious how long you've been in energy and what's sort of your origin story of getting into energy? Because you worked for Deloitte for a long time in, in the energy sector. So I'd be curious kind of your your history and journey. Well, it's it started uh, with a university degree at McGill. And uh, when I graduated, uh, there was no, no opportunity really uh, at the time in Montreal. So I took a job with Imperial Oil in Toronto. That was wow. my first entry into the uh, energy industry. Uh, it wasn't my life's ambition to work in the field, but uh, it was more opportunistic. And uh, that was uh, Imperial Oil, a great company to work for if you ever get the opportunity. Uh, I then joined, uh, le left Imperial Oil because they said, you know, <laughs> the problem with 
Problem with you, me, is that uh, I have a, a business degree, not an engineering degree. And they said, you can't really progress very far in the energy industry as a manager because you need that engineering background. We need to trust that you know and you're snowproof when it comes to running these assets. So they said, uh -huh. um, you're done. Your, your career is going to cap out. So I Dude. left, did an MBA, and uh, then joined uh, Deloitte. Uh -huh. and, uh, stayed with Deloitte for um, uh, 29 years. Uh, I, I worked in many different industries, consulting, you know, a bit of a random walk around industrial sectors. Um, and But it, I did take a tour of duty in Hong Kong. Mm. I was um, uh, working in northern China. Uh, and I took a photograph of uh, donkey carts delivering coal door to door. And I know, like for us, you know, it's flick a light switch and you get electricity. They were getting that. I mean, think about this. This is first world coming out of first world Hong Kong, first world Canada. You went to China and it was donkey carts delivering coal. So I, I came back to Hong Kong and said to my wife, half the world gets their energy from donkey carts. Let's just be clear. We can move our whole, I can move my whole career for the rest of my life into energy. There is nothing but unlimited upside to working in energy, frankly. Yeah. And, uh, so that that's when I came back to Canada, I then uh, shifted careers over to the energy industry and I've never left. Fascinating. And, uh, yeah. And now, uh, these days, I live in the Sunshine Coast because I originally was thinking there would be a significant liquefied natural gas export industry here. Yes. And I wanted to be ground zero, where the projects were likely to happen. So I read a while back, and I think it got axed. Wasn't Chevron going to like basically construct a, like the first hmm. all-renewable energy-powered LNG facility, export facility out of Kitimat? Wasn't that... Uh, so th there is a Kitty Mat project. It's called LNG Canada. It's actually a shell project, although shell. it has other investors. Uh, I think Petronas and um, Mitsubishi, I think, are co investors. Okay. Uh, uh, offtake. Uh, usually, when you're not, you're investing in these things and you're not the operators because you want the offtake. So, yes. Uh, and it's uh, going to be uh, the, their their plan is to turn that into the greenest liquefied natural gas available by using renewable energy to power the energy the the gas turbines that uh, chill the liquefied natural gas down to liquid liquid form. Yeah. So, uh, so the first is likely to be LNG Canada, although there are two other projects coming along uh, that that are going to follow in a similar pathway. Get green energy is the basis for running the plant. Fascinating. No, it. Uh, I read that, and I forget what I was doing. But anyway, it's a it's a fascinating uh, idea, and the topic of LNG in itself is fascinating. I, I'm here in Houston, Texas, and so of course along the Gulf Coast, we've got a lot of export capacity. A lot yeah. of which is coming on over the next few years. Um, there's a lot of hype around LNG, and and so when when it comes to my career, it started off. You know, I started drilling wells in Alberta when I was 18 years old. Um, never drilled anything in northeastern British Columbia. But for those listening, we're sitting on, or I say we as Canadians, are sitting on a crap ton of natural gas, um, of which a lot of it comes out of the Montney. Um, yeah. But the reality is, and, and maybe you could give us just a high level overview of like where we're at, because politically, there's a lot of headwind with producing natural gas and oil and gas, regardless, you know, in BC, British Columbia, or Alberta, everything else. Do you see there being a lot of runway or is, are we going to be hindered by the political system? Uh, hindered by the political system and uh, probably more the regulatory uh, system, uh, I think is the, probably the greater hindrance. Hmm. Uh, the uh, and you're right. Just come back onto the fact base. So Canada has some 400 years of proven um, natural gas reserves uh, that uh, it could exploit. 400 years at current production levels. Mm -hmm. So there's no risk to the Canadian economy to get this gas uh, onto title and get it to market. Yeah. Uh, so so the problem is um, uh, how do you how do you uh, build and secure these projects. And that requires uh, federal government uh, regulatory approval for export. 
there were 21 projects in Canada that were approved for export. So the vault, the, the, the government has said there's no risk to Canadian uh, gas, domestic gas supply by exporting. So that problem is not the issue. Uh, the, 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 the issue is uh, the amount of time it takes to do regulatory approvals to build pipelines to move the gas from the, the uh, gas basins where it's um, produced to the coast where it can be liquefied. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge, huge problem. You got to get that gas over the Rocky Mountains, right? So not it's not a trivial, <laughs> so not trivial terrain. Yeah. Uh, it takes billions of dollars. And um, so a huge investment, a uh, lot of in of um uh, indigenous uh, land to be crossed and agreements to be cut. Um, indigenous uh, peoples uh, are suspicious of the efficacy, of the security, and the reliability of pipeline crossing on their territory. It's disruptive to their livelihoods for fishing and hunting and, and the like. Uh, and so getting approvals to get these, these uh, pipes built and then to secure the land and build the facilities at the coast to manufacture is incredibly fraught in Canada. And uh, a lot of projects have simply died because of the amount of time it takes to get through approval. And as you can appreciate, gas goes up and goes down in price. And depending on where you're at in the cycle, your project yeah. is going to be in the money or out of the money. So mm. they, at the moment, there are only three projects progressing in British Columbia. Uh, Kitty Matt LNG will go into production, I think, as early as next year or the year after. So it's coming on stream quite quickly. Wow. No, it's uh, it's it's. Yeah, that's a that's a challenging and, and complex topic, especially Very. like you said, a lot of the territory that it has to cross over. Um, yes. The company that I work for, we do uh, in Canada quite a bit of HDD work uh, underneath rivers and over crossings and stuff like that. And I know a lot of the just there's been a lot of time and resources spent dealing with the local folks in which we're trying to deploy our technology to assist oh, with yeah. these, these drills. Um, yep. and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very challenging. Um, and, uh, hopefully there's a, hopefully, hopefully that sort of stuff kind of works itself out, or at least people are more receptive to it as new generations sort of get into positions of authority. But, um, anyway, we're not here to talk about that, but it's just an interesting conversation. It <laughs> speaks close to home. Most of my family's from BC. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very, you get, you get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I for an Australia, I lived in Australia for four years, and I worked on all of the um, LNG export projects there to one level or another. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. so I know a great deal about liquefied natural gas, and it's fascinating. It's, um, yeah, it's what's interesting. I'll just we'll just close on this and then move on to other things. But yeah, uh, here in North America, you know, when you're energy rich and you're a rich society, uh, you know, natural gas is viewed as a problem, right? It's a problem. But if you're over in Asia, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, you know, a place of 3 billion people, to them, natural gas is the solution. Right. The solution. So we we might see it as a problem here, but there's a lot of people who would who want that gas and badly because it's so much better than their alternative, which is burning dung mm. or wood or in the case of China, coal delivered door to door by donkey right or yeah. um uh, uh, fuel um bunker fuel for energy production coal for power production big coal plants like yeah. natural gas is a big step up an improvement for a third of the world yeah so no, and, and we're sitting on it here and we're burning it off we're trying it. to you know and we, we, it, it's the problem <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. Um, anyway, no, let's let's pivot. But I, I appreciate the conversation there. Again, I live in that world. Uh, the company I work for, we drill for you know a lot of our customers drill for natural gas, and so we're yeah. really hoping this Henry Hub price starts to trickle up, and if we get a cold winter, which right now is not uh, looking like it is. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. I digress. Moving on to digital transformation in oil and gas. Yes. Uh, if if the folks listening, if you've been in the industry. You'll remember the 2014-16 downturn. To me, and, and from what I remember and, and even my own experiences, that's really when, I mean, it was always there, but I feel like there was a lot of emphasis put on when time slowed down, it, it sort of ramped up, and now, and then even more so during the pandemic. Um, I'm super curious, like, share your perspective on, on how 
the pandemic, because that's still kind of close in the rear view, um, has fast tracked digital adoption in the industry? Because from my experience, it did. It, would you oh, agree yeah. or can you can you share your experience? Oh, yeah. The the pandemic had a huge impact on the the role of digital innovation in the oil and gas industry. Now, uh, I, I, I know we know we know Houston had some some interruption in, in energy, but that was storm related. Right. Uh, if you going back in, and just thinking about the Canadian context, there were no interruptions of energy supply during the pandemic. Now we had interruptions in toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, yeast. so did we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had all kinds of supply chain interruptions, uh, but energy ran like a top. So, th so we're talking about an industry that's built to run regardless of the conditions. But the industry had to make some very fast moves at the start of the pandemic, and one of those was uh, to move very, very quickly to cloud adoption. So hard to believe this, but in the last, just in the last two years, 60% of oil and gas companies have, have migrated or started a cloud journey. Oh, you said 60% or the last two years? Just in the last two years. Wow. Yeah. That's rapid. Yeah, yeah it's Crazy. very rapid, but, uh, but you have to go, so go about 2023 to 2021. So in 2020, you have this pandemic, but you know, is it going to really hurt us and what's going on? Well, it became very clear by the end of 2020 that the impact of the pandemic was going to be much more ne nearly permanent. Yeah. yeah, because the vaccines were taking a long time to roll out, and it's and uh, uh, th there's all kinds of population subgroups who can't take the vaccine. If you want to protect those vulnerable people, you have to be thinking about work from home, et cetera, et cetera. So suddenly, it became very, very important to oil and gas that it it no longer view these changes it had put into its business model because of the pandemic uh, as uh, temporary, but rather permanent. And that meant accelerating their, their adoption to cloud. Okay. They also discovered that those parts of their business that were already on cloud solutions, uh, and, that, and here, think about Teams meetings, uh, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, uh, shared data files, those parts of the business that were already accessible on cloud, um, were the ones that were able to keep right on going. And the ones that were paper-based, paper-bound, those are the ones that they quickly needed to transform. And yeah. uh, so that that drove a huge and permanent shift in thinking about the role of digital uh, in the industry. So you're not wrong. It drove a big thing. Yes. Second, did, besides actual the processing itself, it taught the industry that it can move faster than it has ever moved in the past. The, all the arguments about why we shouldn't do something and this shouldn't work is all bullshit. And and the the uh, pandemic ripped the curtain off of this legacy model of of slow slow walking change, and said just it's just just not true. It's just mm -hmm. simply not true. When the industry is confronting a significant enough problem, it can move breathtakingly quickly. It uh, can. That's the prize. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. It definitely exposed a lot of our weaknesses. And although people acknowledged them, they were too worried about what was right in front of them instead of taking, you know, in, instead of making some changes that were somewhat long term or what they thought was long term. But to your point, it yeah. like there was a rapid acceleration in adoption. And, yeah. um, you know, it 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 really sure. it's helped. And because a lot, at the end of the day, we all we as an industry, we had to do more with less. And so we really didn't have a choice. We um, didn't have a choice. And that's that's the whole point, right? When there's an outside yeah. villain at the gate in oil and gas, we know how to slay outside villains, right? The safety villain slayed, right? The, yeah. the uh, pandemic villain crushed within two weeks. Here's a great, great story. You may remember, although not everyone will, a huge forest fire ripped through Fort McMurray uh, back in 2019, I think. 2018, yeah. somewhere in there. I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. Imperial Oil kicked off a project at that time to move one of their control rooms out of Curl, which is one of the oil sands projects down to Calgary, get it out of harm's way. And uh, the project kicked off after the fire and it dragged on and on and on for two years. All the objections and all of the issues you could possibly come up with safety, reliability, performance, uh, backup, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then the pandemic hit and they moved the control room in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, it's a testament to the folks in oil and gas and energy for that matter. It was just like how adaptable we are, you know, totally. I mean, 
you, you know, when our back's against the wall, we find a way to figure it out. And, and now that, that was one of them. And so Jeff, I'm curious, you know, besides the cloud sort of adoption, were there any other digital strategies that you observed during that time to be most effective? And why do you think they succeeded? Well, it's uh, uh, digital is a big, kind of a big topic, so you, you have to kind of break it down into its uh, into its uh, chunks, and then you have to look at the oil and gas industry and in its chunks, upstream, midstream, downstream. It's, it, it's not homogenous, unfortunately, yeah. and then it's not homogenous by country. Mm. So, com- those that are in the national oil company industry, so the big big OPEC and so on. Uh, uh, nations, they have very different drivers for digital adoption. So the pace of adoption is not synchronous, and right. the the actual app moves people take are not homogenous, which hmm. is it's just a, a nice way of saying there is no silver bullet here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> to kind of get this get this done. Yeah, uh, but um, the digital innovations that really matter, cloud was absolutely key. Cyber because cloud opens up the world to, and as you connect more devices in, you have more cyber uh, risks. So um, cyber um, efforts and cyber protections became really important. Uh, another after um, um, uh, cloud was uh, just data quality, data discipline, data acumen uh, became really, really key because um, it, it used to be, you know, when you're in the office, if you got crappy data, you just walk down the hall and sort it. But, you know, now you're all working from home. Doesn't mm-hmm. work that way. So um, getting smarter on data became really important. Uh, we then rolled out a lot more sensor technology because um, sensors became uh, a key part of uh, data collection. And then yep. um, devices suddenly popped up. It became really important. Like if you wanted to, if you were building, say, some facility through a fabricator, you you couldn't send your your guy or gal inspector to see how the fab work was going. That's the normal practice in the industry. You go to the site. Well, you, all travel was shut down. So how did you do it? Well, you sent somebody who was there with a mobile phone and a camera, and then you had a Zoom call, and you did a walk around of the asset being fabricated. Mm-hmm. It, it, and so suddenly this thing became really important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, devices. Um, and now we've, um, it's, it's suddenly, it's only been in the past uh, year, but artificial intelligence machine learning tools have now, dis- have now um, become the uh, a critical part of the digital puzzle. Yeah. Uh, so the, yeah. So the model I tell people is it starts with data. And from data, you need sensors to generate good quality data. You need machine tools and artificial intelligence to interpret the data. You need mm-hmm. machines to then act on that data. And we need yes. the machines because we haven't can't be sending people out to do stuff. So way more automation. And that yeah. all rides on a cloud platform. And underneath that is cyber to keep it all secure and safe. Right. No, it, I mean, the way you sort of frame it, it it's very... It's it's a very easy sort of workflow to understand, or at least simple to get your head around. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's true, and and like you said, depending on the company, the size, the country, you know, what vertical within oil and gas or energy you're in, there's different rates of adoption. But exactly. where, where do you see the sort of the lag right now? And if you want to sort of key in on a certain vertical, maybe one that you're more familiar with or whatever, but like where's the lag, and what's what's the challenge or hesitancy? to kind of move over this, this hurdle that we, we, we may be facing. I know from within our company, one, what we have, but I'm curious to hear what your thoughts as like a sort of a broader view of the whole thing. Well, the, the, what holds the industry back is that some of the assets that we are running uh, predate the internet. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Right? Okay. Yeah. They won't be conduit for running cabling. Uh, you, you won't have room, like offshore platforms, like don't have the room for the systems and the like. So, uh, so we just, have, and we have a lot of oil and gas wells out there, lots of them, which, you know, we run through SCADA systems typically, uh, but SCADA systems aren't very digital. Uh, they are a supervisory control. I mean, the name itself gives you the clue. It's um, supervisory cr- control and data acquisition. So you're keeping an eye on that that asset and collecting data about it. But you're not. There's no two way here. 
and there certainly isn't the the kind of collaborative uh, business model designs you see in um, uh, technologies like automobiles now, where they're communicating with each other. They, that that sort of model doesn't exist in our industry. So the biggest anchor, if you like, is the fact that we have huge investment in legacy assets that are running absolutely fine, but they are frozen in time to when they mm. were built, and they will. Uh, it's very hard to build the economic case to say, shut that asset down and re replace it with a brand new, um, more functioning, more digitally enabled uh, control. It's just not the mm. same. Like when our yeah. my phone dies, I go get a new phone. Well, every three years I get a brand new phone, but we don't tear oil wells apart and replace them to yeah. stay technology. So right. the, the edge is good. But the stuff in the back is like this big boat anchor and you got to pull it along with you as you can. Yeah. So, I mean, what kind of strategies would one suggest or over like recommend to navigate these issues? Cause yeah, I never really thought of all the sort of legacy assets that like you said, are just not really conducive for having all this stuff implemented into them. Yeah, it's very, very challenging um, to to do that. And so to get there, uh, the, the biggest hurdle, so after that, if that's the problem, this old equipment is blocking our ability to progress, uh, the, the one of the solutions uh, is to enable the workforce that is um, looking after administering those assets to be able to identify where there would be some possibility of improvement and, mm -hmm. and gain. And the, and the issue there is that our people in oil and gas uh, do not have a sufficient level of e digital acumen to know where and which parts of those assets they could evolve. And our performance metrics in oil and gas tell our people that change is bad and uh, stability is good. There are three performance metrics in oil and gas. <laughs> Safety, did you come home safe? Well, introducing change, unless it is a change to improve safety, has the risk that it will make safety bad. So mm -hmm. unless, so there's the first, how do you, everything that we do in this industry better be safe. Second is cost. Are you doing things that, to hit the cost target you've got? So unless your innovation is going to improve your safety and lower your cost, Strike two. And the third is um, re reliability or production. Did you produce what you said you were going to produce? Right. N nowhere in there is there a metric that says, and did you improve the business or did you change or did you embrace innovation or did you evolve or adapt? That is, you're not, you're, you're, it's all about stat keeping assets running to their status quo. So we have a, a management model in our industry, which is off kilter with how digital innovations work. And yet we know digital can offer some tremendous value. So uh, the, the problem of dragging these old assets along with us is that the folks who are managing those assets are being told safety, cost, reliability, do not innovate, do not change. How do you, so if you want to fix that, you have to work with the individuals who are running those assets to bring them along for the journey, to make them want to um, embrace even little bits of change so that it improves the performance of the, those assets. Hmm. That's that's what I see as the big the big block. Yeah, no, that's actually, I, I have a customer who's works at a large cap here uh, in based in Houston. Uh, and when there was, we were discussing implementing some technology that from the public pers from the public's eyes would have been awesome but at the end of the day he was like well is it going to make me drill faster and is it going to cut my cost because if not then we're probably not going to end up doing it you know what i mean and so exactly. it's um you know again and and i say that kind of jokingly but the reality is it's like investors have already been tainted and they've got bad taste in their mouths and they're still on the sidelines yeah. hesitant to come back into oil and gas. And so, yeah, it's, if you're not providing value for shareholders and it doesn't affect the bottom line, it's really going to be hard to, to implement um, regardless of what the, you know, regardless of what's said or what's marketed, um, which is a challenge uh, at the yeah, end of the yeah. day. Yeah. Um, yeah. As, as we oh. look 
Sorry, go ahead. I say, so so the, e the easiest, the low hanging fruit, the lowest of the low hanging fruit, if you like, like, like what could you do um, involves targeting the data that these companies already have and figuring out how to extract value from that data. Cause that does not mean touching an existing running asset. It doesn't mean having to replace a whole bunch of fully perfectly good operating systems. It doesn't necessarily mean touching your SCADA environment. It won't impact your safety. So you're you're sort of chewing your way through your your existing data, and that's yeah. that's the big the, the big move I see right now for oil and gas uh, is is to tackle its data assets and see what it can make of them. Hmm. Interesting. So as we as we look forward, um, what role do you see digital innovation playing for shaping the future of of oil and gas, or even just energy in general? Well, energy in general, uh, I believe that it is no longer plausible to separate uh, in, innovations one might take on in a, uh, digital from the development of energy and energy transition pathways. They're in, they're now in totally tied together. Hmm. And in fact, my my uh, most recent book, uh, Carbon Capital in the Cloud, um, paints exactly that picture. It's uh, if you imagine a Venn diagram with three circles, carbon is energy transition, uh, capital is talent and young people and money, and cloud is digital innovation. The, right. the problem in the industry is we often keep the digital and energy decarbonization or energy change or business change in two separate buckets. And uh, the book makes the argument that, uh, that if you really want to have a leverage effect on your innovation dollars, you should be aiming them at those that assist you with helping to deal with decarbonization. And there's a small number of, of investments that I think make have an outsized effect that can actually give you leverage on both. Really? Uh, but there's at the same time, there is a view and I share it, which is the idea that you'll go into a new business, new venture, new energy of any kind, and somehow digital is not central to what you're doing. You're making a huge strategic error. Really? And so what's the risk there? Well, the risk is a competitor comes along with a digital enabled business model that involves new energy and you are caught out. Mm. You, you can't, you can't compete. Right. So what if, what if people are, are folks that sort of, they don't know what they don't know. And although they acknowledge like, yeah, we need to get in on this, but they don't, it's like yeah. information overload. I mean, how, how do people see trustworthy and, and good guided insight? Well, I, I think at the at the outset, if you're planning a business venture in new energy uh, of any kind, hydrogen, geothermal, uh, carbon capture and storage of any of, or any level, uh, if you do not have someone who is and and has a deep exposure to digital innovation and how it has disrupted other related industries, uh, then your business plan will be necessarily flat or or substandard on that dimension. And, mm. and that's the, my advice. Get someone into your business planning cycle who talks that language, understands that world, and can challenge your the thinking on uh, the, the business model design and how it, the business could be set up. If if you didn't try to imagine a business, someone starting a business today, like just, just think about this. Imagine starting a business today where you insist that all the employees have to work in one place. No work from home. Really? Like, could you imagine starting a business today where that was not like that? Ha that's part of the get. That's the new ground rules. So you, you, <laughs> you got to figure that out. Well, if you go that far, why would you not put um, a monitoring and uh, a devices, say, in your equipment and your vehicles? Sure. Why not? They all caught, people all have phones anyway. Why wouldn't you figure out how to strap one of these to your vehicle so you know where your vehicle is all the time? Oh, good <laughs> question. But but yeah. it's hard to believe people start businesses all the time today without thinking any of this stuff through and then and find themselves short, uh, uh, flat footed. Yeah. I'm curious, Jeff, um, can you walk us through any case studies? You mentioned your book and I'm sure there's some in there. Yeah. Um, so whether it be from your book or even the training that you do that really sort of showcase successful digital digital transformation in the sector like can you give us sort of some real world examples that you've been a part of 
Well, digital um, transformation prior to the pandemic um, was a slow moving uh, animal in oil and gas. <clears throat> so it only really picked up as steam uh, in, in the course of the uh, pandemic itself. And if the capital markets were able to recognize a true digital innovation leader in oil and gas, it would show up in their stock market valuation. And today, there are no companies that really have stepped out from the pack uh, in, 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 in any dimension of energy where you, would, you could point at them and go, okay, there's the company to follow because they've figured this out. It just huh. hasn't happened. But uh, <laughs> arguably some of, I mean, they, I mean, arguably some have, because I mean, you have to make step changes, right? Like, I don't think you can just completely flip a business. Oh, a big anchor. Yeah. Right? Got a big yeah. anchor and you got people that have been trained to think in a certain way and you want to overhaul that. And uh, your window to do that started in the pandemic. That's when the pressure really came home to bear. You need to be different. Hmm. So do you we, think it's a lack of effort or do you think it's just we don't have the time and resources to actually implement it? Because it takes time regardless of, I mean, I, I, we've, we've, a, we've been in our company, we've been very open to transforming digitally, but Again, these things just take time. <laughs> they take time, yeah. And and when did the clock start? I mean, like it when? started. It started for us before the pandemic, honestly. Yeah, but you're in the supply chain. You're different. Uh, it's back to if you look at the oil, your customer base, and just ask the question: Which of those have really rethought how they do the oil business, uh, top to bottom, with a digital lens? The answer is nobody has. And that's Fair because enough. they're pulling this big this big boat anchor along with them. Yeah. Uh, so it that the so who stepped out? It's hard to see anybody that's that's really done that. And that's yeah. for the reasons I've shared. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I, I see what you're saying. What I mean, so I mean, just do you think it's just gonna be a slow grind before anyone slow grind. eventually does? Do you think it'll be the pitfall of companies and they'll I mean, do you think it's enough of a a drag or sort of a a slow growth that it ultimately put companies under, or do you think they'll just end the, the cost of doing business will continue to be high until they figure it out? Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the um, personal view is that uh, the value of the product being produced, the hydrocarbon product uh, and is, which is of course being set by the market. Um, the market today continues to show growth in oil and gas, right? Despite IEA and EIA and, and governments say and mandating changes to consumption, the reality is growth continues to go up. So the market hasn't sent a signal yet to the oil and gas industry to say, hey, it's peaked. And uh, so the business model that got you here is not going to be the one that's going to keep you going. <laughs> There's real pressure when markets flatten and start to go into a downturn. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. right now there isn't a signal that tells companies in this industry that they really, really, really have to go and change. Yeah. I'll give you a good example. Um, the, the, it is, it is a, um, I, I wouldn't say it's a, it's, it's a near fact, but I'd say um, it's pretty close to factual. SAP runs the oil and gas industry today, big oil companies, big, big companies. Mm -hmm. SAP is the, the platform of choice in, in most large oil companies that I know of. There's very, very few consequential ones not using SAP. The vast majority of them have not migrated their SAP platform onto SAP's new cloud-enabled, in-memory, app store-driven, blockchain-fitted-out, uh, AI-enabled model. Uh, so hmm. absolutely. They're still sitting on their old system. Why is that? cost a lot of money to migrate right not really it's nothing it's not really broken <laughs> did you see a little thumb up on the screen i know i did i don't know if you were doing that on purpose i like that <laughs> i don't know who's doing that but uh somebody is if i do this sometimes balloons fall down <laughs> i don't know what it is some sort of some sort of zoom thing jeff is clearly digital digitally enabled he's he's doing all kinds of funky things on his screen I um but, but so you, you, you mentioned, you know, there's obviously, so I know for our company, we are making a transformation into things and this thing could be in the yep. millions and millions of dollars. Yep. And when you look at the cyclical nature of our industry, it's like, are you going to get the return on your capital 
by implementing this, if oil prices go down and rate count drops and all of a sudden we're like left holding the bag, but we've got to commit to this like huge transformation that we're doing that could take 18 months. Like, I think that's the hesitancy, right? Like you can't forecast out five years and know, okay, if we drop 4 million bucks on this sure. thing and hire all these consultants that in six months from now, our business model could be completely different because we're just trying to like survive. So like yeah, that, yeah. that plays a part. Absolutely plays a part. And you're, but you're in the supply chain, right? You're of the, of the, if you look at the oil and gas industry, companies that sell services into oil and gas are on a much shorter capital life cycle than companies in oil and gas themselves. Sure. My oil well runs 10 to 15 years, if not longer. Your rig, drilling rig, three years, four years, and then it's so beat up, you, you, you're repairing it, it's high cost to maintain and run. And, and the technology is advanced that it's no longer current. So rigs don't last that long. So our it, companies in the supply chain have to turn over their capital a lot faster. And the consequence of that is that they have many more opportunities to bring innovation into the capital cycle than a typical mm -hmm. oil and gas. And that's because your boat anchor, you can pull it up off the ocean floor a lot faster than they can pull their boat anchors up. So, sure. the, so you have, you're, you're actually, and so should, so the question is, should you? <laughs> well, I'll, I, one example I use in my keynote speeches is Tesla. You know, Tesla uh, started out building shit cars, the little, little spider. It was a joke. And the rest of the auto industry said, eh, well, these, these guys don't know anything. Meanwhile, they're busily reinventing the software that runs the cars. That was the real prize. Right. Then they came out with their uh, their first um, uh, a Tesla vehicle, too expensive, uh, too didn't it didn't build quality was crap, and the auto industry said waste of time. He's just a pot smoking junkie. Thinks he's running an, an a car company. We could ignore him. Today, Tesla market cap is bigger than the next six auto companies combined. It's an existential threat to the to the German auto making industry. There, it's in full meltdown over there because of mm. the the pressure that this is placing on on his companies. Yeah, Tesla had a decade to come to figure this out, and he's just crushing that industry. And you can go into telecoms, financial services, newspapers, entertainment, all kinds of companies show the exact same trajectory. Mm. So, should you do it? Absolutely. Can yeah. You, clearly project the payoff no right no it's i, I agree I, I i oftentimes people kind of laugh where i work at is because i'm always i'm such an early adopter you know what i mean yeah. and and i i very much embrace like the future and technology and i'm like we need to do this and we should try that and they're like whoa yeah. pump the brakes bud like you know so so i i get it and i'm, I'm very much yeah. and it you know it's and, and i acknowledge the fact that it has to happen and and there's some you know, some key stakeholders that also acknowledge it and do, but, um, you know, it takes buy-in from the top down and everyone in between. So like, you know, change management is another big piece of this that comes into oh, play, yeah. right. Um, <laughs> which it could be a whole nother topic of conversation, but at the reality is, is it's like, if a, if a few people within the company want to do it and the rest are kind of, eh, it's, it's near impossible. And so you need like full buy-in, uh, yep. for a lot of this stuff. From the yep. CEO, CFO board down. Because if you're allocating all these resources that take away from like sort of the critical path of like, how do we generate revenue? We do this. Well, yep. yeah, but we're going to spend a bunch of money doing this, which ultimately increases our cost, to which then we need to get more price increases. And then it's just this like <laughs> battle, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, it's it's but again, I love it's it's part of the, the game and and you you deal with it and let the best company win. But um as the, so as as digital technology reshapes the entire industry, hmm. what skills do you believe will become essential for energy professionals? Uh, yeah, this is a topic I get asked um, a lot. I'm actually advising a couple of universities um, on this question um, because they have, huh? they have to develop the curriculum to generate the uh, talent uh, that, that, that they need. Mm -hmm. So the, the uh, so it's a great question. The, um, uh, the the easy glib answer is oh you should learn coding, become a coder. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Chat GPT no. can do that for you already. So why would you need yeah. to learn? 
No, just, no, that's not what you need. What, <laughs> what the skills necessary are that I see uh, down the road um, are going to be uh, weighted towards human skills that machines can't easily replicate. And those yes. skills are complex problem solving, teamwork, empathy. The soft skills. Soft skills, yeah. Communications. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, t- I tell you a, a joke I often use with consultants, but it works with engineers. How do you how do you distinguish the introverted engineer from the extroverted engineer? The extroverted engineer stares at your shoes when he's talking to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. Right? Yeah. 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 So so eye contact, right? Communication skills, storytelling, storytelling, communication yeah. skills, uh, a logical reasoning, complex problem, multi, multi-dimensional problem solving, empathy. These are all the skills that are going to distinguish people down the track. It's mm. not going to be your ability to code. Right. Well, I, arguably, it's a lot of a lot of like the coding and a lot of that stuff the execution piece is becoming easier and easier like and yeah. you can do it at scale with the adoption of ai and different technologies and to your point the differentiator is going to be the people driving this and like the teamwork the collaboration the radically the radical degree of open mindedness to then yes. work and solve new things yeah um you know and again and and i, I mean anyone who's been in oil and gas for any length of time, you've heard the the term, oh, well, we've done it like this forever so many times uh, yeah. to which then, you know, that piece of it, that, that just really stalls our ability to innovate while yes, other yes. industries are, are at like light speed away from us. Um, so anyway, I, I, I appreciate that answer. And I think that, uh, you know, you're starting to see it. And as the new generation of, of kids coming out of college come into our workforce, I mean, I, I've been able to watch interns come in and out of our company now for years. And the, young, the, the older I get, the more I love and appreciate the interns because they have such a unique perspective. And it's easy to listen, oh, these, you know, the kids are X, Y, Z and complain about it and this and that, but they're smart. They learn fast. They can do so many things at once. Uh, and they're very open-minded. It's, it's, yeah. I actually love like the, the, I call them kids, but young adults that come work for our company. I'm, I'm just like a sponge when it comes to even like branding and how to leverage social media, yeah. where, where the consumer attention is. Uh, all of that is just, is super cool to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, the, I think um, uh, one of the, uh, clever things companies could do is take that collection of interns coming in, give them a a mentor uh, who can help shepherd uh, them a, a, a little bit, yeah. and put them at some intractable problem. We <laughs> said, so, well, yeah. how do we fix this? And the yeah. mentor cannot say no. The mentor's job is to put guardrails around safety. But, yeah. but it's not allowed to say, no, you can't do that, or no, that won't work, or no, no, no. They're, they're not allowed to say no. The only thing they can say is yes, and. Right, yeah, yeah. Yes, and it has to be safe. Sure. Yes, and it's got to do this. Yeah. Uh, I tell a story of a, a young engineer who called me, in a, in a, and he was quite distressed. Um, uh, he His job was to go out to the field and inventory the uh, gas wells. And the, the wells had, uh, you know, solar panel, multiple sensors, uh, collection tanks, water tank, um, uh, power supplies. And uh, the, the way to do it was you took this huge piece of paper, <laughs> this absurd original blueprint in a red pen, and you would mark on the thing what it mm. was you saw out in the field. So he's like, no, let's not do that. He went to Best Buy picked up a cheap tablet, downloaded from the app store, a home inventory um, app for building an inventory for insurance purposes. I have a mm-hmm. stereo and I have this and blah, blah. He yeah. put the company's master data into the inventory. And then they went and completed the inventory on a tablet. And then they sent the data in. So it came in daily. It was already correct. Didn't need to be re-entered. It was GPS tied. So I knew exactly where it came from. 
fully described, photograph backed up. Hmm. And he did this for three weeks, came back to the office, the job's all done. And they said, unacceptable, unacceptable. You need to go back and do it again with paper and red ink. What? Right? Yeah, exactly. So he called me to say, what do I do? I'm trying hard to bring innovation here, make this simple and easy. And the company won't let me innovate. Like it's incredibly frustrating for young people. So the, the insight there for me was, ah, well, there's a guy who wants to do, bring innovation in. Who, who was there saying yes and? Instead, what he got was no, not acceptable. And mm -hmm. uh, got sent back out. And by, by the way, he dug into the, why is it not acceptable? Because there were teams of people back in that office whose jobs were to take that big sheet of paper and transcribe the red ink and put it into yeah. system. They had no job. Yeah. Yeah. He came up with a solution that eliminated their job and that made it unacceptable. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, no, it, 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 that doesn't surprise me at all. It doesn't um, really surprise, but like, ah. yeah, it, it makes you want to pull, uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 I pulled all my hair out, as you can see, it's all gone. Yeah, 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 it's gone from that example. Uh, so, I mean, we talked a little bit about like interns, but I'm sort of in general, how would you suggest companies approach talent development and retention, especially given this new landscape? Do you have any sort of themes that you've or like kind of ideas you've built to that you could answer that? Geez, that's a great question. I don't know. I have an answer for that one. Um, Fair enough. I haven't given it much thought. Uh, okay. I, I believe that the issue I see uh, is that um, there, uh, if if you believe that eventually oil and gas demand has to bend down and go flat and then start to decline, if you believe that, then um, there's a whole lot of jobs in oil and gas that have to go away. And uh, we also know that 50% of the oil and gas engineers today working in oil and gas will be entitled to leave the industry and retire within the next decade. So there's a huge wave of people that's about to kind of walk out the industry. Hmm. And at the same time, there's a huge growth in things like hydrogen, carbon capture storage, geothermal, uh, where we need people. Yeah. And um, so to me, the problem is less, how do you retain, develop, and keep people in oil and gas? A different question is, how are we going to correctly staff up the opportunities? There's the, there's that thumbs up again. I love how, it. How are we going to correctly staff up the and, and migrate people over who, who are ready to try something different, move them out of oil and gas and over into new energy? There's a, there's a probably a more interesting challenge. Huh. Because um, the, to me, the new energy companies are go, are out there. They're absolutely looking for people to work in renewables and and the like, and they can't find them. Hmm. Well, no, that's uh, that that is that's that's an interesting sort of way to look at it. And I think, yeah, it's it's a it's a question we try and tackle every day. Mm -hmm. I know for for us in, in our in our sort of sandbox we play in is is attracting talent is tough. Um, Very hard. You, yeah. you know, but I think it comes back to, you know, the branding and the messaging and, and how we communicate to those who otherwise might have never wanted to even jump into the industry. And like you said, you know, whether peak demand is in 2030, 2040, at least in my lifetime, I, I can't see oil demand going less than, you know, right now it's 100 million a day ish it's not going to be below 50 from the, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it, the, the, once it hits demand peak, it's not going to drop off. Right. So I say all that to say is it's just going to require people for the next multiple decades. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, as oil companies and, and, you know, sort of traditional energy companies continue to exist, um, the demand for people is going to be there, but I would say that, you know, we're doing a better job of communicating to the masses on what we do and, and, and how we're doing it. And I think that, from that perspective, it's going to be important is like, how do we communicate to the yeah. general public uh, instead of it always being death and destruction? Because <laughs> yeah. a lot of times- I, 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 I absolutely agree with that. Uh, the, the narrative about the industry has been hijacked by people who don't share the industry's interests. Yeah. And the people who have hijacked the narrative don't necessarily have society's best interests at heart either. 
And um, so for oil and gas uh, to uh, seize back the narrative, it has to step up and create the narrative that attracts the you know, the new generation of talent to work on it. Yeah. And uh, that doesn't, uh, the industry today um, doesn't communicate uh, that it is a truly attractive long-term lifetime employer. When you've got this narrative out here that says we're going to be out of oil and gas by 2030 and you're a young person considering your options, why would you enter this industry? Right. Yeah. Right. No, it's, it's, it's exactly. And that's, yeah. that's a pretty so, easy, you know, for someone looking at it, they're like, Oh, the demand's gone in 2030. Well, hell I'm not, why would you even look, consider that? So um, again, it's, it's very, it's a real topic of conversation, it's a real um, topic of conversation as it yeah. should be. Yeah, uh, no, it is. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I think you're going to say an example of this is uh, the university and, and education system in Canada. The enrollment by of uh, Canadians, people born in Canada. Uh, oh, I've got balloons. <laughs> There's the bubble, the balloons. Yeah, <laughs> it's such a nice the, surprise, man. I love that. <laughs> the the uh, the uh, Canadians born and bred. Um, have abandoned joining the oil and gas industry almost 100%. The, the education institutions now are still chock-a-block full of okay. people studying for oil and gas, but it's all immigrants and foreign students. Yeah. All of whom have the option to stay, maybe, or more than likely, they're going to head back to their home country. Yeah. I uh, actually, interesting you say that. I interviewed a lady from Oxy who's quite high up, not Vicky, um, but uh, someone, I, I believe she is, I think she's global supply chain director or something like that. Her name's Shauna uh, Boone. And anyway, we were talking about the enrollment of petroleum engineers. And uh, here in the US, if you look at the numbers, actually, the Wall Street Journal published an article maybe a couple of months ago and just sharing some of the, the statistics on the drop off of petroleum engineering uh, students applying. Oh. But when you look at it globally, it's actually thriving, like places in like Brazil and over in, I mean, I think in China, and she she mentioned a few of them, uh, to which to my I was pleasantly surprised. I was like, okay, so the rest of the world acknowledges like this is we need oh, yeah. petroleum engineers. Um, oh, yeah. But but is uh, so, so again, that's the solution or the problem? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It was it was it was again good to kind of see and, and hear that perspective because oftentimes we live in a bubble and depending where we gather our information from, we oh, yeah. kind of apply that across the globe, which is just certainly not the case. Um, we're coming up, she's we're just you know, times are flying by. I'm having a, such a blast here. I wanted to give you an opportunity before we started uh actually recording, you had a very fascinating um clip of uh, actually you speaking on your screen can you give a quick uh like what that was because i and i'm i'm drawing a blank on what that was but it really captured my attention i think it'd be neat to share it on your screen if you could for those uh that are watching this on youtube yeah sure well one of my uh one of my my missions in life is to bring messages of hope and, and change to the oil and gas industry because the industry needs more hope and it needs more um, voices that advocate in favor of the industry. So yes. my most recent keynote address that I put together for uh, a, a at the request of Exxon Mobil was around uh, the role of data in oil and gas. And uh, so the keynote is uh, data and oil, not data or oil. Right now uh -huh. our industry tends to say oil but not necessarily data. And mm. what I want to just bring the two of them together. And, yeah. uh, and, and so there is, I do have a little clip here that I can uh, show. This is, uh, I'm just going to turn my camera off and then play the clip, but this is the opening uh, few seconds of this, yeah. uh, this uh, video. You may have heard the expression, data is the new crude oil or some variation like it. Like data is the new oil. It's quite popular. You'd think it was coined by some energy industry pundit, like, I don't know, Taylor Swift, perhaps, or maybe this guy, Justin Trudeau. Well, you'd be incorrect. It's actually from Clive Humby, a British mathematician, who back in 2006 declared that data was more valuable than oil. As recently as 2017, The Economist magazine dedicated an entire issue to the question of whether data was now more valuable than oil. Well, as Neil Boris likes to say, 
for every truth, there the opposite is equally true. It hmm. all depends on how you define value. There's no question that data is an immensely valuable commodity in its own right. And if we hope to harness the power of our digital innovations, generative AI tools, machine learning, to avoid hallucinating with data, we're going to have to rethink our mindset towards our data assets. There you go. There's a little yeah. clip. Yeah, that was so cool. So you that was a keynote speak, uh, speech you did for Exxon, you said? It was commissioned by Exxon, and um, I'm currently delivering it to organizations uh, around the world who uh, want wow. to help educate their organizations on why their data about oil is as important, if not more important, than the oil itself. Now, wow. in the presentation, I show why that's not necessarily true, but there is this huge prize if we, if we can figure this out. Fascinating. And so if, if there's folks out there listening who are interested in 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 speaking with you or, or getting to learn more about that, or is what's the best way to reach out? Uh, just uh, look for me on my uh, website is the, the fastest way. There's a contact form there. Just have to yeah. look for my name, uh, Jeffrey, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y, can, C-A-N-N, and um, uh, uh, ping me and we'll, yeah. we'll uh, get together and talk it through. Yeah. Well, no. And then beyond that, I mean, you produce a ton of content. You've got a sub stack. Um, you generate a lot of good content. And so I encourage the listeners out there to uh, click the links in the show notes. I'll put his LinkedIn, uh, his sub stack and, and uh, you know, enough links to at least get you going in the right direction. And uh, I encourage you to reach out and and definitely connect with Jeff. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. Honestly, I had way more, but uh, clearly there's lots to talk about. Um, these are complex problems, and, and I think having these conversa conversations, thinking them through, and hopefully um, giving people enough information to reconsider their frame of thinking when it comes to their digital transformation uh, for the company they work at, or at the very least, speak up and, and have these conversations with friends and folks that you work with. Um, Jeff, you know, on a personal note, you know, being that you're there in BC, um, I know from my experience living up there for a good part of my life, from now till about May, it's cloudy and rainy. Uh, are you looking forward to that for the next six months? <laughs> or how do you navigate that? Because growing up, I didn't think anything of it because it was just what it was. Do yeah. you go to anywhere for the winters or are you sucked in there in the smog all winter? Uh, to, to, well, uh, the Sunshine Coast is so named because it doesn't actually share the same weather patterns that you, you're familiar with. So it is wet. It is a rainforest. Um, but it is not nearly as unpleasant or constantly raining as it is in Vancouver, uh, actually. Okay. Uh, so it's a very, very, very pleasant place to be here. The temperature rarely goes below zero. So there's no snow, there's no ice. Yeah. So yeah, there's lots, cool. lots, lots to do. So what does an ideal Friday night for Jeff can look like up there? <laughs> an ideal Friday night. Uh, well, I cook for fun. So nice. for me, uh, yeah, my an ideal Friday night for me involves uh, an hour and a half in the kitchen, making a bunch of fun things to eat, glass of wine. Beautiful. My dinner. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then, um, yeah, have a, so, yeah, have fun. Yeah. So if you had a group or like a couple friends or, you know, a significant other that you were just trying to impress and, and blow their socks off, what would you cook for them? Oh, wow. I have a huge range of foods, uh, but uh, my uh, homemade pizza is probably right okay. up there. So I make the dough really? from scratch, the sauce from scratch, uh, and then pick a bunch of different toppings that, that work. But yeah, from scratch, homemade pizza. Homemade pizza. Filling. And what wine would you pair with that? Uh, so always red. Yeah. Always. Usually Australian. So we, we we lived in Australia for, for, for several years and we fell in love with the big, ju juicy, beefy Australian reds. So uh, that's our our, our go-to. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Yep. There yeah. There you go. Awesome. Well, Jeff, this has been an absolute pleasure. Really appreciate everything you're doing for the industry, um, being a voice, a, a positive voice, um, educating people 
truly making a difference. Um, I'll put all the links in the show notes so people can reach out. And uh, for everyone out there, let's always make sure we're approaching the energy landscape with a radically open mind. Be kind and always remember that everyone deserves access to energy and we is greater than me. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. Well, we should have some applause, right? Yeah. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>